I'm delighted to be here. Um, I want to begin by thanking uh, Jan and Allison Rees and Fiona McLeod for inviting me uh, and Sean Lewis for making all the arrangements. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm on land taken from the Ohlone people in California uh, and I stand in solidarity with all poor and oppressed people around the world. Uh, this is my third time speaking in Wales. The first time was in person. I was invited by the uh, Welsh government uh, for a conference. And the second time by uh, PFAN, uh, Parents, Families and Allies Network. So this time I'm going to just briefly describe the experience of New York City and focus on lessons learned uh, that might be useful for you in Wales as you develop a parent uh, advocacy program. Uh, the conditions in Wales now are very similar to what the situation was in New York in the early 1990s when the parent advocacy movement began. Um, you have far too many children in what we call out of home care, foster care, what you describe as looked after children. Uh, you have a punitive, uh, after the fact, adversarial system, which is very much like what our system was. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, New York City had one of the worst child welfare systems in the country. There were almost 50,000 children in out of home care in one city with a population of 8 million which is roughly two or three times the rate of placement of children uh, in Wales. Um, there were 20 class action lawsuits against the New York City government and voluntary agencies for harming children, for failing to support families. Um, it was a, a racially discriminatory system. 90%, more than 90% of the children in out-of-home care were Black or uh, Latinx. One of the worst problems um, at that time was that when a child was found to have been abused or neglected, in 40% of the cases, nothing was done. The child was not removed from his or her home and no help was provided to the family until the situation exploded. Since then, the changes in New York have been dramatic and those changes were led by parents working with their allies. Parents became trained as advocates. A parent advocate is somebody who, uh, often uh, a mother, sometimes a father who had had a child removed, uh, placed into foster care, the parent was reunited with their child, uh, changed uh, his or her life, and then was trained to be an advocate to help themselves and then to help others. Parents and allies working together made dramatic changes. And I want to mention uh, four of those changes. Uh, the first is that, as I mentioned, in the early 1990s, there were almost 50,000 children in out-of-home care in New York City. Today, there are fewer than 8,000 children in out-of-home care, and that number has remained that low for the last four or five years. The second significant change is that parents now have outstanding legal representation uh, when their children are at risk of uh, being removed from them or they're about to have their uh, parental rights terminated. Parents are now represented by a legal team of a lawyer, a social worker who investigates the case to make sure the parent's perspective is documented, and a parent advocate to make sure the voice of the parent is heard. This model of interdisciplinary legal representation has um, been evaluated and found that it reduces the length of time that children remain in foster care by at least four months uh, saving the government millions of dollars each year. The third significant change is that there are now more services available to help families. Um, we don't have all the, the best kinds of services that are needed, but there's been an improvement. We still lack adequate mental health services. There's not enough substance abuse programs for uh, mothers and their children. Uh, and housing is still a serious problem. A, a large number of children come into the foster care system from the homeless shelter system in New York. 
in New York. Um, the fourth significant change is that parents now have a significant voice at all levels of the child welfare system. Uh, at, on their individual cases, parents who are trained as advocates work in child welfare agencies helping other parents, and they have a role in shaping public policy. The example of New York City spread to other high income countries. In a study that Andy Bilson and I did called the International Review of Parent Advocacy and Child Welfare, we did it for the Better Care Network. We found over a hundred parent advocacy programs in, in over a dozen high income countries. And I wanna give just a couple examples of what's happening in some of those countries. Uh, in Queensland, Australia, for example, the former Minister of uh, Child Safety, Dee Farmer, established a parent advocacy council to advise her on what the perspective of parents are and how policy should be shaped. Um, Finland sent a delegate to New York City to see parent advocacy in action. Uh, based on that review, uh, the government of Finland uh, established a parent advocacy program where parents are now counseling uh, other parents who are going through what they went through. That's operating in Turku, the second largest uh, local authority in Finland. Uh, there are also grassroots movements of parents organizing. In Canada, there's a group of First Nation grandmothers who are organizing in Manitoba, an organization called Fearless R2W, where grandmothers and their children are organizing to keep uh, their children in the community and for the uh, indigenous community have to have greater control over the child welfare system. Also what's developed is the International Parent Advocacy Network that Sabre and I both work with. It's an organization of parents and allies uh, who work together to support fledgling parent advocacy groups. We provide training, support. Uh, we've produced something that's online that may be of use to you. It's called the Toolkit for Transformation. It's uh, videos and stories and interviews of parents. It's primarily in the voice of parents with child welfare experience. And they talk about how you create a parent advocacy organization, how you support parents, train parents, uh, deal with issues of trauma. It's a wonderful resource, the toolkit for transformation. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the role of the Child Welfare Fund, which was a catalyst to bring about uh, the changes in New York City. Uh, it was a small foundation that gave small grants uh, to provide catalytic change to improve various aspects of the child welfare system and to help parents have a voice. Uh, I worked for the Child Welfare Fund for 18 years. Uh, we, we operated with two underlying values and principles. The first is that people have a right to participate in the decisions that affect their lives. And that if people participate in those decisions, there's a greater chance that their needs will be met uh, and their rights will be protected. The second principle was that people working together at the grassroots level can be an important, effective, force for change. You need a countervailing force to push the system to change, and parents and their allies working together can be that force. I now want to mention a few of the lessons that we learned that may be applicable for the situation here in Wales. The first is that an alliance of parents and allies is the strongest force for change. Parents working alone can be effective and allies working alone can be effective. But when they join forces, you have a very powerful countervailing force that will push the system to change. And the allies uh, who work with parents are uh, academics, social workers, administrators, lawyers, foundation officers, and anybody who wants to support parents to have a voice. The second lesson learned is that to have dramatic change, to dramatically reduce the number of looked after children, 
you need to make dramatic changes in the system. Everything needs to change. You need to change structures, to change policy, and you need to have supportive leadership. You need to have top-down change where government and professionals make change, but you also need bottom-up pressure from the community, making sure government does what the community wants. The change government will make by itself is what's convenient for government. And often government will make change that uh, reinforces the status quo rather than really changes it. So you need a countervailing force to push. I want to mention one um, grassroots organization that we supported that had an interesting role. It was the Child Welfare Organizing Project, which Sabre Jackson worked with. Uh, it was an organization of parents and social workers working together to train parents, to be leaders, to have parents coach other parents to go through the system, and to press for policy change. But in the beginning, the government would have nothing to do with the Child Welfare Organizing Project. In fact, the commissioner, uh, Scopetta at the time, said that nobody from the government agency could have anything to do with the Child Welfare Organizing Project. The head of that organization, Mike Arsham, uh, led perhaps the most militant of the parent advocacy groups. He comes back at the end of this story in a very interesting way. A third lesson is that parents need to be trained as leaders. You need to have parent leaders to create a parent-led movement to transform the child welfare system. Professionals uh, can help, professionals can be supportive, but you need to hear the voice of parents and parents need to be helping each other. Uh, the training that parents received uh, had three parts. The first was classroom training where parents learned the rules of the child welfare system, the history of the system, how to speak in public, uh, how to become advocates. The second part was experiential learning where parents uh, shadowed, followed uh, an existing parent advocate to learn how to best support parents and families. And the third was um, support groups so that parents could get together and share their problems and learn how to turn their uncontrollable rage from having a child removed from their care uh, to be productive anger so that they could use that anger to change the system. The fourth lesson learned is that you need to change the attitude of social workers and the general public towards parents. Parents have been demonized. The stories that reach the press are the most awful, though relatively rare cases of extreme abuse, when in fact, the vast majority of children who come into the foster care system come in for reasons of neglect. In fact, well over 60% of the children in care in the United States uh, come in for reasons of neglect. Um, I want to mention several of the things that we did that might be applicable here to change how people see parents. The first thing, we created an awards program so that a parent um, who works really hard to be reunited with their child, we gave awards in a public ceremony. The press came, people learned about how much parents love their children and how hard they work to be reunited. Second thing we did was to uh, support a publication called Rise Magazine. I encourage you to read it at risemagazine.org. It's free online. It's written by parents telling their stories, uh, telling what recommendations they think should be made. It covers different aspects of the child welfare system. It's read by other parents, but it's also read by social workers to learn the perspective of parents. The third thing we did was to create a, a, a publication called the Child Welfare Watch that critiqued the child welfare system. It came out with a publication every six months. Uh, and there was a public forum where there was a social worker, a representative of the government, uh, and a parent speaking about the issues that were being raised in the publication. At the first of these forums, a man, the commissioner of the child welfare system, William Bell, felt so criticized and so attacked 
that he said he would never participate in another forum again. He comes back also at this, at the end of this story in a very surprising way. And the editor of this publication, uh, a man named Andrew White, uh, also comes back in a very interesting way in just a minute. The fifth lesson learned is that it's important to employ parents, to pay parents, to work in child welfare agencies, to be coaches, to be mentors to other parents so that uh, they can help parents going through what they went through. Parents who have experienced the child welfare system are in the best position to be able to help other parents. I want to quote from Commissioner John Mattingly, who was a commissioner for seven years from 2004 to 2011, talking about the importance of parent advocacy. He said, everywhere you look in this city where we are doing our best work, where the best is happening, you find parent advocates around. All this activity created a movement, a countervailing force that pushed government to change. The sixth and final lesson that I wanted to share today is that you need to institutionalize change. You need to change structures, you need to change policy, and you need to have supportive leadership. And I'm just going to give one or two examples in each area. In terms of new structures, we have something called initial child safety conferences, where a group of people uh, get together to talk about whether a child can remain safely at home or needs to be put into a, a foster care placement. We pilot tested having a parent advocate be at each of those uh, initial child safety conferences to make sure the voice of the parent got heard. <clears throat> the project worked in one small community district. It was evaluated. It was found to be so effective. It reduced the number of children who were referred for foster care. And both the parent and the social worker had a better experience when a parent advocate was present. Because of the success of this program, every child safety conference in New York City has a parent advocate trained or somebody with similar experience to be an ally of the parent. Last year, there were 10,000 child safety conferences where a parent advocate was present. We also changed policy. We had to bring a lawsuit to do it, but we changed policy. It used to be the policy that if a parent was being battered by a spouse and the child saw it, the child could be removed for what was called failure to protect. The mother failed to protect the child from seeing her being battered. We changed that policy through a lawsuit. It's now no longer legal to remove a child just because the child has seen a mother being beaten. You also need supportive leadership. And this is where those three people come back. Mike Arsham, who ran the most militant grassroots organizing project, the Child Welfare Organizing Project, who the government said could have nothing to do with the government agency. Mike Arsham in 2014 was appointed the director of advocacy within the government child welfare agency. Andrew White, who was the editor of the publication where the commissioner felt so criticized he'd never participate again. Andrew White was appointed deputy commissioner for policy and planning within the government child welfare agency and he remains in that position today. And finally, Commissioner Bell changed his attitude towards parents and towards uh, parent advocacy. And I want to read a quote from Commissioner Bell that he said, speaking to a group of parents uh, in New York City. He said, the New York City child welfare system has fundamentally changed over the last several years because you parents have forced us to change, because you have said openly and loudly, things cannot go the way they are going, and we listen to that. Commissioners change, parents change, and systems change. We can push to make them change and have to be doing that. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. How are you? Um, bringing you greetings from the United States, New York, to be exact. Um, I want to say thank you to David and the uh, 
the folks who put together this conference. Um, this is extremely exciting. And just to be able to participate in a conversation like this, I am very honored. So I am, as I said, I'm Sabra Jackson. I have been a practicing parent advocate for almost 16 years. Uh, and David referenced some of the experiences that I had in my personal and, and professional training. But, you know, most of the time people always ask me why I uh, came into the work of parent advocacy. And I said, well, it's because I have a moral obligation not to allow anyone to go through what I went through as an impacted parent. So I worked in human services for 20 plus years before I had my child welfare case. And at the time of the children's removal, I actually worked as a consultant for the New York City Department of Education. And I was the PTA president for my daughter's school. But I also lived a double life. I was using substances to mask the suffering of the domestic violence and the loss of my mother who I had been caring for, who died at 89 years old. I wish I could find the words to describe the depth of pain when I held my son at the hospital and they removed my daughter. And my daughter was physically abused in foster care. During my case, I would stay overnight with a friend. Why? Because it was too painful for me to go home to see all of my daughter's belongings and all of the things that I had prepared for my son thinking I was bringing him home from the hospital. So I had to make a decision what I was going to do to allow the suffering to be my demise emotionally and spiritually, or was I going to allow it to transform me, to heal my whole family and to turn our pain into power. So towards the beginning of the case, as David referenced, I found the Child Welfare Organizing Project, where we call, we fondly call it CWAP, which, which was the first child welfare parent advocacy organization actually in the world. Having that community parent advocate allowed me to begin my healing in a safe space with people who truly understood my pain and I didn't have to have any pretense. Those advocates helped me to know my rights and fight for my children's lives when, uh, when the foster parent and the agency couldn't see it. That plus the determination of all of the services needed for my own healing, I allowed my children and it allowed the system to return my children to in my home in six months and eight months home permanently. So the next step was becoming a parent advocate myself, which was extremely important. And that helped me to regain my self-esteem. When child protection came to my house, they saw a shell of a person. They didn't see all the things I had done professionally. They didn't see all the accolades and degrees I had from myself and my family on my wall. At my first appearance at intake, the case planner told the judge, Ms. Jackson says that she has worked in the human services field for 20 plus years. And the judge said, well, you should have known better. And as you would know, my self-esteem went straight down the tubes. Becoming a parent advocate began to reverse that. So as David referenced, Mike Arsham, who was the director of the Child Welfare Organizing Project at the time, he would always push us at the time. He would um, provide opportunities to speak with stakeholders, politicians, child welfare leaders locally and naturally. We were having rich experiences, which actually poured a lot of love into me. So the first time I knew I had done something impactful was when I graduated from CWAP, the Child Welfare Organizing Project. And the second time was when I sat with Michelle Cortese, who founded one of the three parent defense organizations in the city to give parents perspective to the New York County Law Association. 
I was scared to death. The panel was full of bunches of judges and lawyers, and I thought, oh, wow. So I can sit side by side from someone who is in the legal profession and my voice actually be heard? What I wanted them to hear was the fact that the narrative about me in the petition may say one thing, but that's not necessarily the story of Sabra and where she comes from. I wanted them to understand that legislation and policy need to consider the parent voice and need to reflect stories like my story. So by that time, I was about a year sober when Mike tapped into my professional experience and, and pointed me to oversee the initiative that placed parent advocates at the child safety conferences in New York City for the first time ever, which David referenced. Those conferences had parents who had been through the system sit with parents who were going through the system to advocate for them at the moment that the city was trying to decide whether or not to take their children. So me having been a case planner, planner and one of my strongest skill sets was being able to put services in place while sitting right at the table. I can remember vividly having to go, a family going right into a mother child program straight from the safety conference, meaning that we did not have to separate the two. We did not have to separate the mother and the child. I can remember we sat there for hours. By that time, I knew some of the major players in the domestic violence field. And I was able to use those connections to make sure that the family got into the program. So I also remember wishing that I had had that opportunity when the decision was made to make to take my children, but I didn't lean on those feelings. My focus was making sure what happened to me didn't happen to anybody else. So after that, I spent a year working as a parent advocate as a at a child welfare agency. And then next, I went to the Center for Family Representation where I worked for seven years as a parent advocate and then a parent advocate slash housing specialist. All of the work that I did in the many different venues allowed me to see all sides of the system. So in 2010, I had the distinct privilege of being able to go to Beirut, Lebanon with the National Advocates for Pregnant Women as a part of their International Harm Reduction Conference. I was able to speak in front of thousands of people to share my story in so many different languages. And some of the people who came up to me after, we didn't speak the same language, but their story was very much like my story. We lived thousands of miles apart. Their countries were just beginning to see some of the transformations like we've seen in New York, but they told me that their story, my story gave them some hope. So the past two years, and as I said to you today, I'm coming as a parent, a practicing parent advocate. I am telling my story in my journey. But the past two years, I've had a leadership position at the New York City Children's Administration for Children's Services. I oversee the permanent, uh, I oversee the permanent voice within the minute, within the administration. If I didn't have the training and grounding and the healing and the love poured into me <clears throat> from parent advocates. First, I wouldn't be able to come in, as we say, come inside and have the kinds of relationships with child welfare that I do. That an impacted parent have a leadership role embedded with the system that once separated her family is meaningful and not just to me, but I believe it in it impacts other parents. Because when the system comes in our lives, so many of us believe that that is the end and that is truly not the truth. We believe that even when we're reunified, it's going to happen again. And we're going to go to lead at, but really we are not some parents actually feel that they will not lead a life of prosperity. And that is absolutely not true either. But in New York City, the parent advocacy movement has grown so much 
and an extent that we are seeing parent advocates supervise other parent advocates. We are seeing community organizations leading initiatives inside the system. And we are able to model the kind of power for parent leaders who are just emerging and for parents who are going through the system. It gives them a sense of hope. And as parent advocates, we hope that we hope that we can transform that feeling to our children so they can also heal. So once I was working at the Center for Family Representation, I met a mother who said, you know what, you don't understand, Sabra. And I said, I do understand. And I shared her with her just a snippet of my story just enough so she understood what I had been going through. And she said to me, you don't look like somebody who went through that. And my response was, what do we look like? And I asked her, she said, you know what? I never thought about that. And I also said to her, I need you to sit with that. And she did. And it helped her to shift. And actually now, after many years, she is now a physician's assistant. It helped her to shift just that snippet of my story and it helped to model what could come next for her and many other parents. So thank you for listening to my story and I hope that it will be helpful in your journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Saber, and also to David. That was really fascinating. And um, there's lots of questions in the chat that we'll put to you um, at the end. But first of all, we're going to hear now from Fiona McLeod. She's been leading on a project to develop parent advocacy pan in West Glamorgan over the past year. And Fiona is going to present the work that they've been doing. We're also going to hear from Sana Malik, who's a founding member of PAN, and also Naomi Hanmer, who's a new parent representative. And I believe we're going to start off with a film that's been very cleverly put together by Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we are going to start off with the uh, audio recording, which fortunately Jan for us has been very helpful in putting together. I think that sort of sets the tone for things. And as I understand it, Rian is going to assist us to press the play button. So if we start with the, uh, the recording, please, Rian, and then we'll pick up from there. Thank you. I have a daughter who is nearly 14 and in terms of my experience it falls into two separate categories if you like. I have a 15 year career as a lawyer and 10 of those years have been spent heavily involved in uh, child protection uh, proceedings and then five years ago I ceased doing that work. Work, um, when I became uh, very ill in 2017 as a single parent who developed quite a severe mental health uh, condition I was sectioned and the local authority um, issued an application for an interim care order now the reason they did that was because when you are sectioned you lose capacity to make decisions uh, my daughter's father sadly passed away when she was a baby so there was no other parent that had PR in existence and the local authority <clears throat> felt very much that they couldn't make decisions moving forward without sharing PR with me at the time from my my 10 years of professional experience what I can say about my observation of, of parents in, in the child protection and the care system. I'd say you're dealing with the large majority of parents have not deliberately hurt their children or caused harm to their children. There, of course, is a small category, and that's a different category, but what I would say is in 10 years, the overwhelming majority of, people, of parents have not 
put their child at risk deliberately. And what has happened is common theme running through is mental health problems, lack of support, um, issues that arise often from disadvantaged backgrounds or lack of understanding. Um, and by the time the local authority get involved or have got involved with those parents, even if they have people around them, they are isolated and or they often had told me as their lawyer how isolated, how alone they felt in terms of their journey. Now, I could not particularly empathise or relate to that until 2017 when off the back of my own mental health breakdown I found myself in the same position. And I'm a birth parent and I do also have children living with me and by profession I'm a mental health support worker. It's very, in, in terms of the experience that I went through, there's no doubt about it, the loneliness just led to more mental health issues. Um, and any time I tried being my own best friend and trying to pick myself back up, that was shot down again. To be honest with you, the isolation was that they didn't, they don't give much information. They ask all the questions and they don't explain to you why they ask questions. And then you, you've opened up, you've given all this information, and then they, they don't tell you what the next process is. They just say, I'll be in touch. They don't tell you what they're gonna do with the information. They don't tell you when you, when you share an information with, with, with them. It's like, what are you gonna do with that information? And have I made myself look bad? If I'd have done something wrong, I, I didn't know who I could turn to and actually speak about how I was really feeling. Because even though you can have support around you, you can still feel alone and not want to express how you're really feeling just in case it, it affects your case. Some people had a, had a different understanding to the way I saw things. But I suppose when you're in, when you're, when you're in it, it's hard to, hard to be comfortable when you're in that situation. Um, and then the isolation is, no, if you're not, if, you, if your parents, uh, your family and your friends do not get it and, you know, that um, if you're not going through the court process and being involved with all these services, they're not going to understand how you feel, you feel isolated, you feel lonely, you feel as if that you're, you're the only person going through it and nobody would understand how it feels to be fighting for your children. And the isolation is laying in bed at night, panicking, having panic attacks, being off your food, and then you don't want to share too much with people because you think that they are gonna be concerned about your mental health. And then before you know it, your mental health is just plummeting and you're too scared to open your gob. And, and if I'd have had some support, that wasn't so red tape, um, I think I would have been a lot less anxious, a lot less stressed. Helping other people with this, currently we don't have a system in place to support people. However, because we, there's a number of us, not just part of PAN, but PFAN and PAR, um, we've been able to support each other and doing what we're intending to do with each other. And that's been great because we've been able to still be professional because we are working in a professional atmosphere, but also still be able to take each other aside and go, I'm not okay right now. And I'm feeling this way or that way, or why don't we try this? Or why don't we try that? And I think that's great because then that gives us some sort of an idea of how we can move that forward. And at the minute, it is trial and error between all of us, really. Um, so it, it, it's learning in that as well. I think um, when you've got, when you, when you know you have a parent advocate who will be able to take you hold your hand or like, you know, metaphorically hold your hand through the old process, somebody that you can ring up if you feel the need that your 
you don't understand what's going on or you don't know what the next step is or you don't know um, what could happen to have that person to be able to which is completely separate from a professional and a family member somebody who can be completely emotionally detached who would be able to give you like a reasonable um, support network that will be more of reason and be able to not will be able to provide like the emotional support to a certain extent but would also be able to kind of unpick the knots that the that this process cause in your brain it causes so much brain fog and questions about your own parenting but it's to have somebody there kind of cheering you on and being be in your backbone sometimes because I think you get to a point where you want to give up and to know that there is somebody to be able to share with who's already had that knowledge even when you are going through the most like you could lose your kids or you've lost your kids but they say yeah, that you know you have this option because when I was going through it even though I did have somebody to share with me their experiences you don't think you've got choices? I think a parent advocate, the advantage over a parent advocate versus the professional generally is that what you can absolutely guarantee in the parent advocate is that they have been through something that will create a sense of empathy that perhaps is lacking in the professional despite all the best efforts and wills in the world we all know the very simple thing if you've been through something the same thing or something similar you absolutely have a different humanistic empathetic approach compared to doing a job where you think you're doing the right thing my head tells me that it it will be a positive support system um and it would be it would be bringing the best out of people because they can see that there is, there are people that have done it and had, I, your past doesn't make your future, your past doesn't make you, your past makes you who you are, it doesn't define who you are though, you can make mistakes and, and come back from it. But thank you, thank you very much um, for that and thanks very much to the uh, to the, our parents on the uh, PAN, Parent Advocacy Network for West Glamorgan for um, working to put this um, audio recording together and to Jan for all of the efforts that he's made in, in actually putting it together, uh, undertaking the recording and then doing the editing and overlaying the images on top, a really superb piece of work. I think really that the recording gives the messages and sets the tone for where it is we feel that we are currently in West Glamorgan and points the way really for the direction that I feel is important for us to travel in terms of Wales and the wider UK. But I think beginning is a good place to start and really we are at the beginning uh, in terms of parent advocacy in um, West Glamorgan and in Wales and David pointed out that he thinks we might be in Wales somewhere close to where uh, you were um, in the States back in the 90s but where we are is we want to make a start, we want to make a difference and we want to make things happen uh, and I'm just going to take you through sort of some of the, uh, the travel that we've been on in this locality. So we have within Wales the benefit of the Social Services and Wellbeing Act which was introduced back in 2014 with the um, intention that we do ensure that we give voice to our citizens and control over their outcomes in terms of their well-being, that we promote that and develop that and we work collaboratively with people, with citizens and our intention is to work in a different way with parents as uh, than we have necessarily done before. Uh, and this period of time since the introduction of the Act also um, mirrors a time when uh, there seems to be in fact actually uh, an increase in formal statutory intervention in family lives uh, and the research which has been undertaken by Andy Bilson, uh, particularly in England, shows that in fact we've had a, an increase in the child protection approaches towards parents uh, with an increase, a doubling of uh, Section 47 child protection investigations um, with a concern that um, 
that uh, children are investigated on a common basis before their fifth birthday. One in 16 of all children are referred to social, one in 19 children are referred to one in 16 children investigated before their fifth birthday. That's a very high proportion of, of, uh, of children within a population. And in Wales, we've seen this um, concern from the Welsh government, from local authorities, from agencies about the increase in children who are, who are or who become looked after with a 22% increase over a five year period to up to 2019 and a considerable concern about the numbers of babies and infants and under ones that are born into the care system. Uh, the overall trend um, isn't this, it's not the same in all areas. There are particular differences and certainly in Neathport Talbot, the area that I'm located in and also Carmarthenshire, there have been large reductions in the numbers of children looked after. In Neathport Talbot, we might suggest that that is something to do with the outcomes approach, which has been adopted by the local authority with a view to work to uh, people's you know, desired outcomes and what people would like to have happen and trying to work alongside families. The number on the child protection register remained fairly static, um, so we're told by the Wales Centre for Public Policy, but of a significant concern on reflection within uh, one, our uh, current authority is the volume, the numbers of um, child protection investigations which are undertaken. Um, and given the fact that only 40% of our current um, uh, families, children are brought to conference, it leaves us with the question mark over what's happened with the 60% of child protection inquiries we've undertaken, uh, that go nowhere, that we're doing nothing with. Um, so, I mean, that's the kind of the background in, ter in, in terms of uh, where we are currently from a, a local authority and, uh, perspective and, and safeguarding board perspective. Um, and our current aims as a, as, a, as a network, as a small network, is to establish the very things that have been discussed by David and also by Sabra. We would like to see the development of individual case advocacy for parents who are going through the child protection system I'd like to see parents who are experienced, have lived experience, trained, supported, and able to provide that level of service to parents who are going through the system. We want to uh, develop programme advocacy in terms of uh, ensuring that we do provide appropriate training and support uh, with um, parents as they become parent advocates and provide advocacy to other parents. And we want to see um, parents uh, in a parent-led movement developing and um, influencing policy uh, on a number of different levels. So essentially, we're really talking about a shift of culture. And we appreciate that, in fact, the, the system as we have it now does not embrace parent expertise and voice. And that's what we want to have happen. So that's what we're looking for. Um, the benefits of parent advocacy, I think, have been helpfully outlined really by David in terms of the, uh, particularly the, uh, the experience in the United States. But it, it, I think it's, it's worth to bear in mind, you know, essentially, what are they seen to be? What are seen to be the benefits of parent advocacy? I think we can see that parent advocacy does instill hope in parents who are going through some very difficult experiences. Um, and also for professionals to have that notion that in fact actually other things are possible for parents and that we're not taking a deficit-based approach. Um, Self-advocacy is something that comes with parent advocacy. When, uh, as was said earlier in the audio recording by Dawn, Dawn spoke about parent advocates acting as a backbone for parents when they're at their lowest. So we would want for parent advocates to support parents, but also to help develop self-advocacy and build confidence in parents to become their own best advocates. And we see parent advocates from experience across the globe um, uh, serving a really helpful role in terms of filling gaps and uh, developing the mediation and the bridge between parents and professionals, which often exists, building trust and connecting to, to services. Uh, I think Sabra earlier mentioned about how great she was at putting services into place. And we know that parents who've got knowledge on the ground can often do that for other parents. Um, and ultimately we understand, we appreciate that there really needs to be a, a major cultural shift in terms of agencies and the way we perceive parents and what parents are capable of and what they can do. Um, I'm going to move on a wee fraction here, if I may. Uh, so in terms of making it happen, where are we currently? We're in our early stages, certainly. We have developed within West Glamorgan uh, the Parent Advocacy Network. We've got a steering group together, which has taken about a year, I think, Sana. Sana was 
the founding member, the founding parent representative together with myself as a kind of project lead in developing a steering group, uh, developing a project. So we have a steering group together, which is made up currently of um, six parents. We've been working on men and we saw a man last week briefly, but he disappeared. But we are working on, on having fathers involved in our group. Uh, but it's not been uh, it's not been achieved so far. So we're looking to develop the project. Um, we did support the conference that um, David spoke at last year in November. Um, as Pan, we supported the conference, which was hosted by PFAN, which is Parent Families and Allies Network, uh, which was intended to stimulate really um, the development of parent advocacy across Wales. We've undertaken parent consultations online. Over this whole period, of course, the thing we haven't mentioned or haven't mentioned so far is that we've had COVID-19 raging around the globe. And so contact and connection with parents you know, hasn't been at its easiest. But nevertheless, we've undertaken a range of parent consultations to elicit parent views on their experiences of services and their views on what services we'd like to have developed. We're talking to parents about parent advocacy in a climate where parents don't know what parent advocacy is yet or what it might become, but we are starting to educate and to stimulate views on that. Um, in the current um, climate with the Welsh Government, money has become available towards the end of the last financial year, and I have now been uh, seconded to um, focus and concentrate on the development of parent advocacy in this particular area, so I'm looking forward to, to, to that. Um, but we've yet to develop the actual services on the ground, and that's what we're looking to, that will be our next sort of stage of development, is to kind of get services going. And understanding that service development is important, but we're not just talking about services, we're talking about a movement, we're talking about change really at an absolutely fundamental level. Um, themes from the consultation that uh, you might not be so surprised to, to hear and to understand. People have talked about, parents have spoken about their experience of statutory services, and they've spoken about the difficulties in terms of being understood or misunderstood, misinterpreted, the loneliness that has been so uh, well documented in the audio recording earlier, the loneliness, the isolation, um, and the lack of support, the labelling, the stigma, essentially the I think it's referred to as a diminution of social capital. People are finding themselves stripped of uh, relationships and stripped of employment, getting into the system. Things happen that really reduce people. And, we and the, the discussion around having a voice. And one parent uh, spoke about the fact that being in the system, so to speak, was like being in a dark room with no light zone. Um, as a parent advocacy network steering group, parents have also spoken about their views about parent advocacy and how they see things. Uh, we've spoken about giving a voice to the voiceless, about being heard, about building bridges, about giving space for parents to speak freely without concern about what they might say. So, and that, that's really an important thing about one parent speaking to another parent. Um, and we've also, spoke, we've also heard about, uh, from Naomi particularly, making reference to empathy and the fact that a, a person with experience can work with someone in a way that no other person can. Uh, so ultimately, we're looking to balance or rebalance to shift things um, from uh, uh, the current position. We want to develop more positive relationships between parents and professionals. But we want to shift the system so that parents really are empowered and supported and are authentic partners uh, at the table with professionals. Um, and ultimately, we want to look at improving outcomes, what we know from parent advocacy experience across the globe and particularly in the United States is that parent advocacy does help to build better cooperation between parents and professionals. It does reduce the need for statutory intervention as alternative options and thoughts become possible. Um, and also it does help to reduce the numbers of children who become looked after and helps re reunite children with their parents uh, much more quickly. Uh, at the end of the day, really, it's about building authentic, genuine partnerships between parents and professionals and, um, and really taking listening to parents much more seriously than we have done to date. So that is the, 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 the outline of what we're doing currently as a, as a network. What I'm going to do next is stop sharing my screen, if I can do that somewhere. Yeah, press that wee button. Stop sharing the screen. And I'm going to pass over to Sana to talk a bit more about her experience. So Sana, if you don't mind, I'll pass over to you. 
Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Sana. Um, I'm a birth parent as well as a parent with children living with me. Um, I'm by profession. I'm a mental health support worker. Um, now, in terms of my experience, so it started. Well, it turns out it started when I was a child, but I wasn't aware of that. Um, but in terms of my memory, in terms of my children, so it started the first time when um, I was in an abusive relationship with my parent and I tried to get away from that and that parent involved social services on me and for some time I was not listened to um, when I was saying no this is my mum I was just trying to get away so why am I now fighting for my child? Um, but after a while, it became a positive relationship. And after a while, they went away. Um, fast forward a little bit of time later, um, my mental health deteriorated. And in terms of accessing help, at that time, it was just my uh, doctor who gave me medication and of course I had two young children at that point and had no other support other than my mum who I had a toxic relationship with and so I wanted help in terms of being able to be a parent and manage being quite severely depressed um, so via my daughter's school asked for help and instead of being supported the first thing they did was threaten me and say, you need to get back to your house now and we're taking your children off you, um, rather than supporting. Um, and then it became quite a bit of a fight. So my oldest daughter was placed in the care of her father who she'd only just met about two months prior. And my youngest daughter was placed in with my mum. So it spent a long time fighting I had to have supervised visits whilst uh, myself and a few other people constantly letting social services know that there was abuse going on in terms of my parent with my child and either I was being blamed for that which there was nothing I could do I mean social services had placed my child in with the care of my parent um, and I was unable to actually go and be with them um, all things weren't being reported um, and things were being um, not documented correctly. So a lot of the time things were falsified. Um, so conversations that never happened, meetings that never happened or conversations that did happen, but words had been twisted. So on a number of occasions, it was, I want my child back. And them saying, oh, she said she doesn't want her child back. Sorry, <laughs> my dog saying hello. Chase it down. Um, and it got to the point where the situation became very dire and I knew something had to be done. So I ended up removing my daughter from my parents' care. The issue with that, that then allowed social services to be able to take full hold and place my child into foster care. Um, which then, so there's what's called a twin tracking system. So they look at the parents as well as other avenue. It was, but throughout it, I wasn't being looked at despite the fact that I was trying to put things in place. Um, a lot of the time, it was a lot of hoops I had to jump. And if anything, I jumped them all and then some. And that was never good enough ever I'd walk from one end of Cardiff to the other because I wasn't driving just to go see my daughter in um, a supervised capacity and that would take me about an hour and a half to walk um, and it got to the point then where um, it was decided that she would then be placed up for adoption and again that was another situation where my they ask you your views, but they don't take hold of them. So based on skin color, despite the fact that she was a mixed race, they didn't want her to feel uh, left out in terms of that. Um, and 
placed her with a family completely based on race. Um, but yeah, since <sighs> through my experience of that, um, it's very much been the case that, uh, that I found anyway that social services are a hub that have access to so many resources that the general public have a harder time accessing than social services do. And actually, they're the ones that you could go to and say, look, I need help, but I can't access this and I want my children to be okay. So how can you help me? And instead of signposting, the view is rightly so. I mean, social services do have to look after the kids. They do, and that there's no doubt about that. However, it's very tunnel visioned. So the viewpoint is that if a parent has approached or is being approached by social services, the viewpoint is very negative. And that's not just a social service thing, that's a cultural thing, that, that's society. The second that anybody hears that social services are involved, instantly you're a bad parent. And the expectation of the parents is so high that you can never meet them. So there's this idea that we all have of the perfect parent and the perfect home. However, it's completely unrealistic. And when social services are involved, you have to meet those expectations. Otherwise, your children are being removed. Um, and it, it is unrealistic. Um, you can't meet those expectations but also you've got a lot of social workers who do have the best intentions they really do a lot of people do go into the service to say I want to help the problem with that is that a lot of social workers don't have children themselves or that they have grown up children and forgotten what it's like to have little ones and the reality of life um, so you're more likely to have a supportive social worker who tends to have young kids themselves. So they're aware that your home isn't always going to be tidy. They're aware that your child has probably thrown their food off their high chair about a million times over and you've tried to clean them up and clean the house up and tried to give them fresh food and it's just happened all over again and you've given up because you're tired. Um, <laughs> Whereas a social worker who hasn't really got that experience or has forgotten, they're going to come in and say, and go back and be like, they're not looking after their kids, their house was messy, there was food all over the place, there was food all over that child, you know, and then that impacts the parent because all of a sudden you're a bad parent just because you're doing what a parent does, <laughs> you know. Um, but I found as well the because of the focus we are not seen as human and it doesn't matter what hoops you jump through their job is to place the child wherever they can but actually all of this can be turned around it really can because as Naomi said in the audio recording most parents haven't actually intentionally or or intentionally harmed their child at all um, it's been asking for help or somebody advising that they have help and support. So say, for example, that if somebody has come from an abusive relationship, they are then actually going from one abusive relationship to another because social services are saying, well, it's your fault that you're in that abusive relationship. So we're removing the kids off you from you rather than using services like women's aid or shelters or other services that are there. Sana, can I yeah. talk a wee bit just briefly, just where yeah. around parent advocacy and what we're currently up to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, because of all these things that can be signposted, all of this can be corrected. Now, since then, um, in terms of parent advocacy, what I found is that I have personally supported parents in doing facilitating support groups and we've I've learned a lot um, and even spoken to prospective adopters and train them. And our aim is really um, and hope is 
to try and build the gap between social services and parents because parents and social services have essentially the same goal it's just being done in two completely different ways but it's very treaded at the minute um that doesn't mean to say that it can't be rectified but if as David mentioned earlier if everything's restructured and seen in a different light but also parents if they're helped to understand what social services are looking for they will be able to work together and I do think that it can be changed and that's something that we we're trying to focus on in parent advocacy to give parents a voice so they're not alone and they're trying to keep their families together you know and hopefully social services will allow them to do that thank you um, thank you thank you Sana. i do appreciate that i'm just kind of a wee bit concerned about the time now that's all right sorry i went off <laughs> thank you very much for that if you don't mind, it was it's really well to hear all of that and also about the changes anticipated. And with that, I'm going to maybe ask if Naomi could perhaps call in and talk a little bit from your perspective, please, Naomi. Hello, everybody. Firstly, can I say thank you, Son? I thought that was excellent. And uh, it is very difficult, as we know, to actually give specific details. And, um, and uh, uh, you did really well, brilliant. Thank, thank you, you, and Fiona, for bringing me in uh, on this project. Now, Time is limited, so I want to address two points in particular here. Um, you'll have heard uh, a little bit about my journey, and it's not that that I'm going to talk about. The two points I'm going to address are firstly, uh, the underrepresentation of the father's voice as to where we're at at the moment. And the second point I want to talk about is the clean language training that we've, we've been uh, uh, enjoying. Now what I'm going to do is, is talk about the second point first. Now clean language training is something that um, is quite an interesting concept uh, because we are using or exploring the use of metaphor um, in communication now, depending on how you advocate and advocate and in what capacity and in what forum, it requires different techniques. Now, fundamental to any training that, um, that relates to the use of appropriate language in a particular situation, underpinning that is the empathy because when one is being trained to use different language, you have to understand why you're being trained to use different language in different situations. So it's very, very, very important. And in relation to what we've been exploring to strengthen communication in a different way as the use of metaphor. So it might be something I might try and give a go. I will put my hand up and say, as I have dyslexia, there are certain things, and anybody that has dyslexia and is high functioning will say, certain things don't quite click as, as quickly as they do with other people. And for me, the use of metaphor, I've had to really, really practice this in my head in different ways. And I have actually struggled on day one to even understand um, the reasoning for it. But a little bit later down the training, I think this is very valuable. Now, I want to come back to that issue of clean language training or our training because the use of metaphor, let me address the elephant in the room, which is the listening to a nine and a half minute recording, which I think we have put together excellently well, but you don't hear a male voice. And that's the elephant in the room, isn't it? Where's the father's voice? Now, what I want to say about that is there has been significant efforts being made behind the scenes in relation to fathers because we are currently voices of the female but we do not have the father and I have spent a significant amount of time in my career addressing the disproportionate approach that fathers feel and actually have been subjected to across Wales and probably in elsewhere. 
they certainly struggle to be treated fairly. And I think that's a fair statement. Now, what I want to say is, I have no doubt, and perhaps New York will, will, will let us know how you found this issue when you were setting up uh, your project, because I think we, we anticipated that it was going to be difficult to bring the father to the table uh, in terms of the empty chairs and the reasons we all understand about a father is a parent as well as a mother. Uh, and what I have done is I want to talk about a father's voice and give you a little bit of conversation about that. And I have permission from Father Jay. I'm going to call him Father Jay. He knows all about this. He was a gentleman who, a father who has been through the system and has struggled himself and very much has demonstrated an interest to me in coming on board um, if he can as uh, a father's voice. Now unfortunately what happened earlier in the year is he suffered a bereavement and that means that it's not the right time for him. However I met him uh, in a psychiatric unit and that's where our journey of friendship starts as parents and we have maintained that journey. So I spoke to uh, Father Jay uh, yesterday and I explained, because I've been explaining what I'm doing, the voice of the father, where we're at, what we're trying to do. Um, and he, I, I, I said, how do I, I said, Father Jay, how do I move this forward when I can't get, um, I can't get a, a father to the table? And he said to me, you've got to think about the reasons why maybe that you can't get fathers. And I said, OK, can you help me with that? And he said, well, you've been talking to me, Naomi. And this is how he talks very rough. You've been talking to me, Naomi, about your, your, your language training. And I just want to say, I don't think that as a father, I don't think I'd be great at this because I've got the attention span of a gnat. And I said to Father Jay, the attention span of a gnat. Um, that led to a conversation about whether there's any scientific evidence that underpins the statement of, uh, that implies that a gnat has a very short attention span. So <laughs> this conversation in humor, and this is interlinked with the relationship that you need to build up with parents and San has alluded to, um, we came to the jovial conclusion in our conversation that um, that uh, potentially the Nat may have had a longer attention span than he did. And we laughed about that a little. And I then said uh, to him, what do you think I can say to a group about how fathers feel? And he said to me, Naomi, you can tell the group that it's shit for fathers in Wales. Use of language, rude, but appropriate because it's quoted. And I said to him, I understand that. But how, I asked the question again, help me understand how I can bring people to the table so that we can better the situation for fathers because understand it's going to be very difficult to pioneer through the voice of a mother. We do need the fathers and we do need fathers to support other fathers in the longer run. And he said to me, Naomi, if you want a metaphor about your table, if there's ever gonna be a father who pulls up a seat, uh, sorry, pulls up a chair to the table, the chair will need to be sufficiently strong to sustain the pain and the weight of the disappointment of the father. And in that moment, I nodded and I understood. We understood each other. I said I would convey that message 
and I thanked him very much and said well, is there any final thoughts that you would like me to share and he said well I've got a sense of humor since we're talking about the use of language probably not best to tell them Naomi that I got uh, let me use the words exactly I got a tug from the policewoman yesterday I said what do you mean by that father Jay he said they pulled me over to check my headlights because one of them was broken it was a police female police officer that I know that led to a comical conversation about uh, what others might consider the use of the words a tug and he knew this and he was taking the mickey out of me and he wanted to show that one day if he is capable of joining the group that it would be humor that he brings to the table and then I said that's hilarious thank you very much Father Jay I will indeed uh, embarrass myself on that point because it uh, it brings the issue about don't prejudge. <laughs> I wasn't like I prejudged the fact that I was prejudging and don't isn't that an issue that happens too often and doesn't it suggest something about the requirement of context around a sentence and doesn't it say something about how different people from different parts of the world will interpret different statements differently and you will be treated differently according to people's lack of understanding rather than their actual understanding. So Naomi? that said, I'm going, Fiona, yeah, just take have I got much time? Yeah. Have I got much time? I was just about to wrap up. Yeah. So final to finalize and to summarize, it is an important point to make. I said in all seriousness, Father Jay, is there a final message? He said, when I was beaten black and blue and strangled and nearly murdered by the mother of my children, because I'm six foot, because I'm a father, because she's five foot, eight stone and blonde, I've got no chance. Nobody listened. Nobody helped me. I don't think anybody helps fathers. That's what he wanted to say. So thank you very much for listening. And to conclude on a metaphor, if the PAN project, if, if the vehicle, if the PAN project is the vehicle, then the fuel is the training to arrive at destination change. And I will hand back to the firm driver of that vehicle, which is Fiona McLeod. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much both Sana and Naomi. And really, it's about communicating through stories, isn't it? And about uh, ensuring that um, we check our assumptions with people and that we understand perspectives. Um, and we hope that um, in the work that we're doing with the Pain Advocacy Network, that we'll take heed of all of that. Um, as we said earlier, we're on the early beginnings. We're in the early beginnings of our journey, but we've got high hopes and great expectations. And thanks very much also for David and for Shabra for sharing your inspirational stories and understandings with us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Fiona, um, Sana and Naomi. Very much appreciate you telling us your stories. And, um, you know, they're very moving to listen to, but also very thought provoking about how things need to be different. Um, I'm going to now put some of the questions to the panelists. And um, I think you agreed whilst I wasn't able to get a connection earlier, David, that you're happy to run over past um, what six o'clock our time to answer some of those questions. So obviously not everyone will be able to stay, but I think that's our plan that we will try and address as many questions as we can. And I think one of the first ones was about gender from Sean Erickson, 
um, David, and I know that um, Naomi's just sort of talked about that in terms of a Welsh perspective, but I think it would be very interesting from a US perspective to Sabre and David, if you could tell us anything about um, the gender of advocates and how you've um, managed to engage male advocates. Um, most of the advocates, as has been said, are mothers. There are parents, uh, advocates who are fathers. And there were in New York, uh, at least two organizations that were led by fathers. Uh, one was um, Parents in Action, which was led by a Latino man who had his child taken away. Uh, and he was training other Latino parents. Um, there was a group of fathers who had been in prison uh, and came out of prison and wanted to be reunited with their children uh, called the Birth Fathers uh, uh, Support Network. Um, <clears throat> getting fathers involved requires additional work, support. We provided small grants to help nurture their organizations, uh, some training to learn about how to uh, uh, create an organization. But I think it's extremely important uh, that, that fathers become involved. I think we have a, a sexist child welfare system that blames mothers for the problems, uh, which has uh, pushed fathers away and they need to be involved. And uh, I, I strongly support the last speaker who was so eloquent about uh, having fathers be involved. Thank Anybody? you, David. David, I don't know if Sabre's got anything to add to that. No, i just like to echo David. Um, Naomi, thank you for referencing as you did. Uh, my uh, parent advocate colleagues who are males um, often reference, even though many of them have been practicing for quite some time, there is still uh, a disproportionate number of uh, males who uh, our, our advocates or even step up to um, try to intervene or gain custody of their children because of the fact that they are so demonized and marginalized. So I'm going to pause there. Thank, thank you. Um, the, ne the next question that I've got is from Sean Thomas, who says, what does bottom up pressure from the grassroots look like in reality? So quite a difficult question to um, pose. I don't know, uh, David? A grassroots work means people from the community working together, sharing their experiences and becoming a collective force. Uh, one of the things that was done was there was a conference organized um, by uh, a young woman named Mabel Paulino from the Latino community who uh, brought together probably a hundred parents uh, to talk about what their common concerns were. Uh, another uh, mother um, um, organized a group of parents in uh, Harlem uh, to, to come together in a church to talk about uh, what their problems were with the child welfare system. Um, it means parents becoming a voice for change, uh, parents speaking at legislative hearings, not just representing your voice, but that you're part of a grassroots organizations of other parents who have had similar kinds of experience. It's creating a pressure group of people from the community so that there can be community control and decision making about what happens to the community. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question that I've got is um, from Susan Harry, which said, I know that note that David Toby stated that children could no longer be removed when the parent failed to protect. What's the current solution to children exposed to violence um, to protect them in the US? Well, I think the most important thing is to get the abuser out of the household. Uh, so that the, the child can be safe. It's the man that's the problem in, in most of these abuse situations. Uh, also, when the, the law changed that you can't remove a child just because the child has seen a mother being abused, there may be other uh, problems in the family and uh, the, the, fam the mother needs support. And if uh, there are dangers to the child, you would remove the child. But that uh, witnessing a, 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 
a parent being abused shouldn't be the reason for losing a child. Okay, thank you, um, David. Um, the next question or comment is from John Callow, um, who says the UK legal system doesn't support positive risk taking. How have you challenged the wider system? <laughs> I don't know any child protection system that's risk taking. Everybody wants to make sure it's somebody else's problem and that they don't get uh, punished. Um, it's a hard thing to do. And I think one of the important things is to create supports for families so that you can uh, have families get this the help that they need. So it's not as risky a situation where either you leave a child home in a risk situation or you remove the child. The, the better solution is to have the parent get the help that they need so the child's not at risk and that the social worker doesn't have to take a, a great risk. They can uh, make sure somebody's in the home helping the family, the family gets daycare or the kind of uh, supports the family needs. I imagine other people have ideas about uh, that as well. I think there's quite an important point as well of if we actually think of the first door knock, it's about how I approach, you know, the Children's Act when it came in, uh, I was actually just qualifying at that time and there was a lot of criticism of the Children's Act because it was pushing us down the legal route and almost taking away the control and the autonomy of the, of the social workers. They were in need to improve uh, time scales because it could take seven years to get a care order because of the, the number of court challenges that could take place at that time. But around 1992, um, uh, Baswood had done a, a, a series of uh, workshops where they brought social workers from across Europe to look at each other's systems and, you know, still got the books on that. And there was a classic quote from, from a, a German social worker looking at the British system, said, when you knock on the door, you, you, you say straight away to the families, I'm you're on the child protection concern. Whereas in Germany, we'd never do that. We'll knock on the door and say, we understand your family needs support. And, it, and one of the problems we got in this country is we become very child protection driven in our thinking. And some of that is to do with the big public inquiries that we've had, where we look at a very small minority of cases and we apply it to the vast majority of parents who become known to social services. And we all treat them as they're going to be the next baby P or the uh, Kimberly Carlisle or whoever. And how do you actually build up trust with a parent when you're coming in with that kind of view? And I think there's a lot of work that we need to do around that. And uh, a quick plug for a publication that Social Care Wills are going to be producing. They, they're doing it with a, a, a good colleague in Swansea University called Nick Andrews and Emma Miller in um, Strathclyde University. We're looking at outcome focus pro approaches in Wills. And their publication quite pointedly is going to be called Friend Not Foe. I think that's quite an important point that we, we need to be thinking of parents as people who, as Naomi quite, put, quite eloquently put in her audio recording, are, are wanting to do the best for their children, but may need support to, to, to achieve that. Okay, thank you, um, Jan. I don't know if anyone else has got any comments on that, or I can move on to the next sort of comments and questions in the chat box. Okay, I've got um, a comment here from, and a question from Philip Evans. Thank I think I was going to say something else. I've got an unstable internet connection. I don't know if you can hear me. I was just going to say something about the creativity that comes to the table when parent advocates become involved because they have a different perspective, but also it changes the relationships, not just between the professionals and the social worker, <clears throat> but between professionals as a force with parents as a force. Because I think one of the things that I've noticed in my years of practice is that parents come to the table that we talk about generally unsupported, um, uh, whilst all the professionals around the table are backed up by the power, the force of authorities, various authorities. And in ensuring that parents are a force, not just individually and powerful in themselves, empowered, um, but it changes the nature of the relationship between parents and professionals and that that can have a powerful influence on the outcome of decision-making. Okay, thank you, um, Fiona. Um, 
I'm just go going back to com um, comments and questions. So I've got one here from Philip Evans. So thanks to everybody for sharing some very painful experiences and the way in which radical improvements can be achieved. The partners in West Glamorgan should be congratulated for their pioneering work. And is this happening elsewhere in Wales? I don't know, Fiona, if you're able to respond to that. I'm not entirely sure what, I know that there are moves afoot in some different authorities to start to develop parent advocacy. And a number of authorities, including Newport, um, I have been made contact with PFAM, which is Parent, Family and Allies Network, to look at promoting things there. I know that there are different things happening in different areas. There are some things happening in North Wales in terms of intensive family support. And there are a number of different initiatives I think that could be looked at as empowering families. Whether it specifically comes under the category of parent advocacy is, is something else. I'm aware that uh, NIAS in Gwent are operating what we refer to I think as a, a professional parent advocacy service. But what we're looking at from the West Glamorgan um, area is very much parents who are essentially paraprofessionals who are trained and supported to become advocates in their own right, parents with lived experience, who therefore have that understanding and that possibility of connecting with parents who are going through these processes in a different kind of way. Okay, thank you, um, Fiona. Um, Ju Julie Boothroyd just saying thank you to Sabra and Sana for sharing your experiences, how useful it was, and really helps us to look to spearhead the change needed. Very much appreciated. Um, Sara Newman says, Sana, that was excellent. I'm a social worker and I recognise your story, sadly. Uh, and Leanne has suggested some uh, um, a, a father of her child who might be interested in becoming a parent advocate on there. Sean has just commented that male trauma behaviours are not recognised um, by services. So she thinks that we have a lot to do um, there. And I'm just looking now at a comment from Candice, who works for NIAS as a parent advocate. And a question she'd like to ask one of the panellists is, is there any advice on hard lessons learned when beginning this work? That you'd like to share with regard to building valuable connections when advocating for parents with statutory services. So some of the hard lessons learned perhaps. Hi everybody, it's Sabre. I think I referenced it in, in my story. Uh, my mentors, David and Mike and many of the folks that she, that uh, David referenced, one of the things that they poured into us is not to be afraid to speak to the stakeholders. Our voice has value. We are the experts about our stories and about our lived experience. And um, I, for me, that is one of the hardest lessons learned in, in my development of being a parent advocate. Staying at the table when it, it is the most difficult conversation and maintaining mutual respect with those stakeholders? Uh, I'd, I'd add uh, two things. One is uh, when we began, social workers were very fearful of parent advocacy. They thought they were going to lose their jobs. The, social, the parents would tell them what to do. They'd second guess them that there'd be a lot of conflict. That's not what happened. The parents had very different roles. And one of the things we found is that there's a principle in sociology uh, that says uh, contact reduces prejudice. And there was a lot of prejudice against parents. When, when social workers could meet parents outside of the contact, context of them being a case, it changed their view and reduced uh, their fear of uh, parents uh, taking away the social workers' jobs. Uh, the second, I think, most significant challenge is tokenism. To have one parent as a figurehead on a board who really doesn't have enough support to take independent positions. You need to have a critical mass of parents so that they feel empowered not uh, as a foreigner in a, in a environment that's not uh, theirs. Thank you very much, um, Sabre and David. 
Um, there's uh, another comment question here from Susan Harry, which is going back to the situation of domestic abuse and um, the changes in the system in the US. And she just asked, what if the victim fails to leave the perpetrator? Um, you know, what has your response there been, I guess? What I will say is my experience as a parent advocate, we look at cases, each case is an individual case. And because of the fact that a lot of us are trained, um, we look at the safety of the child first, no judgment. And um, I think I'm gonna stop there because it can get very complex. There is no cookie cutter answer to that. Um, one of the things that I can say is that uh, we do not victim blame. And so with that being said, uh, what I can say as a survivor though of domestic violence, um, the policy and practices have come a long way in the past 16 years that I, 16 plus years that I've been practicing. And that has to do with the advocacy of folks on the ground, such as myself and, and others who are survivors. So I'm gonna pause there. I, I, would I... Add, I would add one thing, which is I think uh, one of the reasons that uh, people stay with an abuser is because of fear and the lack of alternatives and that you need to create those alternatives, real jobs for a person who's been, uh, so that they can live independently with real housing. Uh, you need a support network and then it becomes easier to uh, leave somebody who's abusing you. Thank you. I've just, I've got um, a question here from Anna Collins and I think we'll probably make this the last one now. And um, she says how helpful and interesting it's been to hear from people. And as a professional, it's been a battle for her. And at times she's been a lone voice advocating on behalf as, uh, of parents. And she's often felt marginalized as a professional. And she's ha asking how can professionals be better um, supported to develop PAN. So. Mm. Yeah, I think um, the point that was made by David earlier, which was about needing to have support from the top down, as well as having pressure from the bottom up, really comes into play here. It is, I think, really critical that we ensure that we have the support of the senior managers and the directors of our agencies in ensuring that the time is given to develop new and different ways of working and to see the value and the evidence which supports parent advocacy as, um, as an alternative way of approaching things, which doesn't dispense with the need for social work and good relational practice, but that is it accompanies it and in the, in the development of it actually does transform the relationships and transform the system. I don't think it's an easy one, but I do think we definitely have to have ensure that there is widespread support really at a senior level uh, within authorities and actually um, at a governmental level, I think we need to have a shift and a change of approach and tactic and appreciate that parents really have to be much more um, authentically engaged as real partners. I think as well that it's continuing to shout about it really because um, in my experience I have I encountered a couple of social workers that wanted to say something but didn't you know and I think it's having the ones that are speaking about it um, continuing to speak about it and continuing to say this isn't okay we need things to change that may actually push for change to actually happen within this within the system and my other social workers might take lead and say actually yeah we don't agree with this either or this needs to change or that needs to change or how about we approach things in this way instead and um, I think the more you talk about it the less alone you, you'll find that you are. Um, but yeah, I'd say just keep going for it. And it's very brave, you know, especially in a system like that to be the one that says, actually, I want to go against this. It's very, very brave, you know, and I, I completely encourage it. 
Thank you very much, um, Sana. Um, Sean's just alerted to me to the fact that I haven't asked one very quick question. If anyone knows of any parent advocacy services in Northern Ireland, um, I don't know if Fiona or... I don't, but I'd be very interested to find out. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Well, I think, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of chat there saying how much people have enjoyed really listening to people's stories, how engaging they've found it, and how enthusing really to take things forward. And I think, um, you know, developing this movement really is, is so important. And I know, David, that's very much um, your mission about developing this movement. And um, it's great to see all, all this interest and lots of people have been making connections with each other and getting each other's emails from the chat. So that's great to see the development of that framework happening um, in real time. So can I just thank once again all of the panellists. We've so appreciated listening to your journeys and your stories in whatever way. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sure that it will have a huge impact on people who've listened to it. It has been recorded, so people can go back and listen to it again, or people who weren't able to attend will be able to um, listen to the recording. So lots of people saying thank you um, to you. We very much appreciate your time that you've given to us. Um, so thank you everyone for, who's attended and contributed to the session. So I'll draw that to a close now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. It's been a great experience and very yeah. good. Thanks to all.